It seems that whenever somebody comes up with an unusual way of showing data, whether it's for a news story or an information graphic, that there's this inevitable response where people ask why they didn't use something more common. I'd like to summarize this response as them saying, this should have been a bar chart. Meaning it's too fancy, or there's too much extraneous stuff in the chart, or it uses an unusual and maybe completely novel visual representation, and the person making that comment clearly doesn't think that it needed to. Why is that? And why is it that at the same time, some of the most famous visualization examples from the history of visual data representation are unusual and not things you'd ever actually use to show data today? Hi, I'm Robert Kosara, a lead research scientist at Tableau Research. I'm interested in how people communicate about data using visual representations and how we read and understand charts. In this talk, I want to look at some unusual charts and discuss how they can be a good idea and what pitfalls there might be. I think it all really comes down to the purpose and the intent behind the chart. There are clearly trade-offs between different representations and there's a bit of research that I want to point to that has looked into some of them. And I want to show you a little classification of these charts that I've come up with that I think might be helpful. Let's first look at two of the classics of data visualization, Charles Minard's map of Napoleon's invasion of Russia and Florence Nightingale's chart of the causes of death at the Scutari Hospital during the Crimean War. You've probably seen this before, so I'm not going to explain them here. What I want to point out, though, is just how unusual they are. And it's interesting to me that they get mentioned so often when telling people about visualization because they're not the kinds of charts people would ever actually make. It's also interesting that both of these were made not for analysis, but for communication. And that is an important piece of information because it informs the design decisions that went into them. We don't know much about Minar, but we do know quite a bit about Nightingale from her writing. And we do know that she knew how to make a bar chart particularly wanted to get people's attention for this chart, and she did. It was actually quite famous, even in her time. It was originally part of a report that had all those numbers in tables as well. But those tables were dry and inaccessible to the people in charge. But those were the ones she needed to reach to make changes to the policies that were killing people. So she made a novel chart that would make her point easier to see and be much more interesting to look at. Well, a lot of criticism seems to be missing, in my humble opinion, is an appreciation of the intended purpose of a chart. For example, this little piece that was tweeted by the National Weather Service in Seattle last year. It's a chart of sorts, believe it or not, and it's showing you a simple piece of information. Temperatures will be dropping significantly over the next few days. That's it. That's, that's the whole thing. I think this works quite well because it's whimsical and fun. And what I mean is that it works for its intended purpose. This is not a full forecast. It doesn't mention precipitation or wind or anything else. It's just a cute little chart-like thing that gets your attention, gives you a piece of information, and then you move on. But it's easy to overthink. Like, what are these sleds supposed to show? What's the scale on the axes and so on? And sure, you could make this a boring line chart that would show a lot more information. But that completely misses the point. This was made to be consumed quickly and give you just one little piece of information. So anything more than that, including more detail and more data, is a distraction. For the purpose of this chart and that tweet, it's perfect. Here's another example from Chris Ingraham's excellent newsletter, The Y-Axis. He found a study looking at the effects of COVID, including erectile dysfunction. And the point of this chart was to say that a lot more men with, with COVID were reporting erection problems than men who were not sick. I really like this chart because it gets your attention and it makes a simple point very succinctly. But it's easy to overthink. Even the metaphor here is kind of mixed, what was the different sizes of the bars. But I think it's clear enough what he's after. Of course, if you're a bar chart purist, you won't like the curved bars. They're difficult to compare with any sort of precision. But the difference in the numbers is so large that it really doesn't matter. Even without the numbers here, you'd have a clear enough idea of the multiple between the two. And here's one more bar chart, this one created by McKinsey. It shows greenhouse gas emissions by country, except one of the countries is a cow to represent cattle and dairy farming. I think it clearly gets your attention and it shows you just how huge of an impact cattle and dairy farming have. Again, it's easy to overthink and to criticize. I've seen people say that since the cow is so much wider, it will be misread as showing a larger number than it really does. That may actually be true, though I think that because it's so clearly different in shape, that might end up making it less likely to cause distortion. 
Also, the cow doesn't have a straight top, so its precise number isn't as readable as that of a bar. I've actually done some research on this, and we found that bars with tops that are rounded or spiky are slightly underestimated. But the question is, does it matter in this case? We're seeing that it's roughly on par with the US, that seems like the key piece of information here. And of course, these are 3D bars, which can be bad. You could make this into a boring 2D bar chart, but then it would look just like all the others and nobody would be paying attention to it. Sure, you'd see the minuscule difference between the cows and the US, but these are estimates anyway and so I doubt that this is meaningful. 3D bars also really aren't as big a problem as many people like to believe. Especially when they look like this. Here's a paper that looked into them from the 1990s. It showed that people were worse in reading 3D bars, but only if they had to respond right away. When they were given a brief break, they were just as good as with regular bars. But more damning is that what actually had a larger impact than 3D on charts was the shape of the data. Neighboring bars can influence how you read a bar in a bar chart. I see people worry about superficial chart features, but nobody seems to worry about the shape of the actual data. Now you might think that bespoke charts are for cute information graphics or maybe uh, news pieces where you have to get people's attention. The more serious people who work in companies and analyze data all day surely don't care for these kinds of charts, right? But that is not the case. Analysts aren't always analyzing, they also have to present the findings to other people like decision makers and they need to work with their peers and so on. My colleague Matt Bremer and I interviewed a number of people who work in corporate environments and who present data to others in meetings. And it turns out that they need to get and keep people's attention just as much. Here are a few quotes from our study. One person described noticing that their audience was sometimes half asleep. Another was looking for ways to keep people's attention. One guy had strong opinions on bar charts and in fact said he hated them. And one person expressed what they were trying to do in this beautiful way by saying that they wanted to present ordinary data in extraordinary ways. Again, these are business users, not designers, not journalists. Most of them do their analysis themselves and then have to communicate with others. And they find that the usual charts that they use while analyzing data just aren't working that well when they present to others. So far, I've mostly talked about how these unusual charts draw people's attention and that they get a simple point across. That might sound like I'm saying that they are shallow, but that is not the case. Though I will say that I don't see anything wrong with a shallow chart that gets its point across succinctly and in a way that people will remember. I think that's much more valuable than a more data-rich chart that looks like every other chart. But there certainly are more elaborate bespoke charts that I think work quite well. One particular chart type that I find quite fascinating is the connected scatter plot. This one shows the number of miles driven by people in the US on the horizontal axis and the number of traffic fatalities on the vertical axis. Each year would be a point on a scatter plot with its coordinates determined by the miles driven and the car fatalities during that year. What the connected scatter plot does is draw a line through these points in temporal order. That sounds simple, but it transforms what would be a rather boring cloud of points into a much more interesting shape. You can now see times when interesting things happened, like when major laws were passed so the line stopped going up and, and stopped actually eventually going down. You also see loops. These are unusual because they're not possible in a line chart where time is on the horizontal axis. But here, time goes along the line and both values can go up or down, so you can end up with a loop. There's more to be said about this technique and I did a study on it with uh, Steve Franconeri and Steve Harros a few years ago. What I find fascinating is that it's such a fickle technique. Most of the time, it doesn't actually work. In fact, I've never been able to use it for my own data. I just ended up with a big hairball. But when it works, it's quite amazing. A somewhat simpler version of it is this example, which shows GDP and emissions data for a number of countries for two different years. Granted, there are only two points for each country, but they are connected, so this is technically a connected scatter plot. While this won't have any loops, it does have one interesting feature of the connected scatter plot, which is the direction and slope of the line. We found that people were actually surprisingly good at reading and understanding what the different directions meant. This is also basically the 2D version of this type of dumbbell chart, which I also think is quite effective. It shows vaccine uptake here, comparing COVID to earlier vaccines. What this chart emphasizes is the difference between the numbers, and sometimes you see that there are inversions where a few categories or countries have the values flipped. Not in this case, though. But all of these charts can be effective both in getting people's attention and then providing them with quite a bit of information to explore.
The connected scatter plot in particular, when it works, also lends itself to annotation. Charts don't have to be static, of course, but animated charts can be a mixed bag. This one from the New York Times works very well, though. It shows how black and white boys from different income groups move up or down as they grow up. Blue dots represent black boys here and yellow dots white boys. The obvious pattern is that while white boys move up, black boys tend to move down the ladder. This is easy to state in a sentence, but it's much more impactful when you can see it happen. And this is what this piece does really well. And it shows not just the motion, but also the distribution of the two races in the income groups at the end. These little strip charts are actually quite effective because we're able to read the distribution like this with a good amount of accuracy. This is a very unusual way of showing data, but I think it's quite effective. But it does require a lot of effort to make, and it is very specific to this kind of data. My examples so far have all been positive, or at least I think they are. But using unusual charts isn't without its pitfalls. There is safety in the familiar in that you can't really go wrong. To borrow a phrase from IT, nobody ever got fired for making a bar chart. So I'll just show one example here, this chart of average female heights for a few different countries. I like this example because it covers a fairly large category of information graphics that use shapes or images to represent data. There are two problems here with how the data is shown, and then there's also the choice of color scheme. But purely from the perspective of the data being represented here, the problem with using human shapes, or really any shapes, is that you typically can't scale them just in one dimension because they would end up looking stretched. So you have to scale them in both dimensions, which then exaggerates the differences. This is different from the cow chart, where the cow was the outlier and the only shape that was not a bar. Here, they're all shapes and they all get scaled in both dimensions. The second problem is that the vertical axis doesn't start at zero. That leads to an exaggeration of the differences here, since they really aren't that large. And together with the sizing of the shapes, this just makes the Indian woman look comically small in relation to the others. Now, the vertical axis doesn't always have to start at zero, and there are reasons for either choice. But when you're showing data as complete human figures, it's basically impossible to not see them as pictures of people, which is why the difference in size is so extreme. If they had cut them off to show only their torsos and heads, that might have been different. It's not like you can't make mistakes when using a bar chart, and starting the vertical axis at a value other than zero is one possible mistake. But it's a lot less likely. But it's much easier to do harm when creating unusual charts since you can't rely on experience or research to inform what you're doing, or at least not nearly as much. I like to think of the charts I'm talking about here in terms of two properties. One is, how familiar is the average person with this chart? There are charts everybody has at least seen before and will understand instantly. There are charts that one can recognize, but that take a little bit more effort. And then there are other ones that are entirely novel that nobody has ever seen before. For familiar charts, I'm going to go with the bar chart here as my example. And we might argue how familiar some of the other chart types might be. In the middle of this axis, we meet the two-point connected scatter plot and the dumbbell chart. Finally, on the unknown end, I'd put the animated black and white boys piece. It might be easy to understand what's going on because it's designed very well, but as a chart type, this is a really unusual way of showing this kind of data. The second property is how specific the chart is to its use and data. We start on the left here, again with entirely independent charts, like bar charts and line charts, that work for almost any data. Then there's what I would call limited use charts that are more specific in their use, sometimes in terms of their topic, sometimes in the shape of the data that it has to have to work. The connected scatter plot would fit here, I think. And then there are entirely bespoke charts that really only work in one context, and this is where I would place the temperature slide. Neither generic nor bespoke is good or bad, it's just a matter of what you're after. These two criteria are somewhat independent, but not entirely. It would be tempting to put them on a two-dimensional grid here, but I don't think that entirely makes sense. But a chart can be familiar and bespoke, like this bar chart of data from a study about how long people like to be hugged, which I think is pure genius, by the way. The connected scatter plot probably falls in the middle of both of these charts. And while the NWS temperature slide is clearly bespoke, I have a hard time deciding where I would put it on the familiarity scale. I think it's quite familiar, but I would be curious to see how people would react to it in a study. Before I close, I want to bring up one more topic that I think is important, but has largely been beaten out of the discussion of charts and visualization. And that is fun. 
Having some fun with a chart goes a long way to getting people's attention and standing a chance of being remembered. But anything that would add fun to a chart is largely looked down on, whether it's a cow in your bar chart, sled sliding down your temperature chart, or a pie chart showing data about pies. We seem to think that if something is fun, it can't also be serious, or you feel the need to strip every chart down to its bare foundations and that way naturally get rid of all of the fun bits as well. But making something fun doesn't have to mean making it silly, and fun can help get people's attention and be sticky. You remember something fun much more than something that's boring and austere. But here again the big danger is that of overthinking. A joke isn't funny when you start analyzing it, and that's I think how much of the fun is just lost in visualization. Because defending the whimsy and the fun when somebody questions your design choices is rather difficult. Another reason for the lack of fun is tool support. It's easy to write software that draws plain charts, and that even can make decent recommendations for generic charts based on your data. But you'll be hard pressed to find a program that will recommend that you put a cow in your chart, or bend the bars. Software also bestows what it can do with a certain authority, so it's easy to think that because you can't easily break out of the typical chart types in Excel or some other charting tool and decorate your charts, you're not supposed to ever do that. So maybe everything should be a bar chart. Maybe bar chart isn't so much a particular chart type as a state of mind. I wonder if it's all a balancing act requiring cleverness, harm avoidance, aptness, respect for its audience, and um, Twitter compatibility? Bar chart! <laughs> and to come back to my favorite quote from our study, not that one, but yet yeah, this one, I think we should all strive to present ordinary data in extraordinary ways. You may have noticed the little numbers in square brackets throughout this talk at the bottom there. These refer to my sources for examples and papers. I've created a little companion web page where you can find those links, plus a few more to other relevant resources. And if you want to connect or see more of what I do, here are a few more places to find me and get in touch. Thanks for watching and take care.